Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Channel 781 City Council Debrief. Uh, this week at the City Council committee meetings, there are usually uh, seven committees that meet. Um, three of them did not meet, uh, I guess, because they didn't have anything on their agenda. Um, so only four of them met. One was licenses and franchises, which, as you may remember, um, that's where an issue came up at the previous meeting involving uh, Brandeis Housing. They did go ahead and approve the housing permit for Brandeis, so we'll talk more about that. Uh, the Finance Committee approved the funding for a traffic study for cannabis dispensaries on Bear Hill Road. Uh, not much to talk about there, but we'll touch on it a little bit. The Community and Economic Development Committee did not meet, but Chris got an update from Councillor LaCava on one issue they're working on, which is the issue of recording and captioning all city meetings. So we have a little bit of an update to share. And then we have, we're actually gonna talk about something that happened in the school committee this week, since there's no school committee recap show. Um, and there was an attempt made in the school committee meeting to ban certain books in the Waltham High School library. Um, so we'll talk more about that too. And actually we're gonna be doing a special report on that in addition. Um, so I'm Josh Kastorf and I'm here with Chris Gamble. Hello. And James Krikelis. Hello. And we have two special guests tonight. We have Kyan Landau. Hi. And Leah Breakstone. Hello. And these are the two student journalists um, from The Justice, the Brandeis uh, student newspaper. And they were two of the reporters who covered the story of the uh, housing issues at Brandeis that apparently got the attention of Councillor Cates and he actually cited it when he brought it up in the meeting. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, so, you know, we, um, part of the reason we're doing this is, you know, we wanted to promote citizen journalism because we feel like there's a lot of important stuff in Waltham that isn't being covered. So we were really excited to see that student journalism actually got the attention of the city council. Uh, so it's great to have you here. Um, before I ask you questions, so James, can you give us an update on what happened at this most recent meeting with the Brandeis housing issue? Uh, so uh, Paul Katz or Kate's uh, opted to approve all of the uh, boarding house renewals un unconditionally, but he's going to be meeting with Brandeis's uh, uh, health board, I guess, uh, on March 7th was the date that he said. So, so it sounds like he, they, they passed, they, they approved the license. So that means they gave up their leverage to they, they don't have anything to hold over Brandeis's head, but they're trusting that Brandeis officials are going to come talk to them about it. Exactly. It strikes me as a little right. optimistic. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah we, Interesting. We, yeah, we talked about this um, the, the last episode where we chatted about it, and like nobody thought that that Brandeis wasn't going to get those permits, but we were hoping at least like some interesting questions would be raised before getting those permits. So it is definitely a little disappointing um, that Paul... Uh, just went ahead and approved it, even though Brent and I said they were going to come. So I don't really know what the difference is. I don't know if Paul like had people breathing down his neck about it or what have you, but um, definitely disappointing. Not, not surprised. Definitely the outcome that was going to happen anyway. So, I mean, it is what it is. Um, but the fact that any questions were raised at all is still um, interesting, still progress, still uh, worth talking about. So for those who don't remember, this was an article that talked about three different types of problems that are going on in dorms at Brandeis. One is mice, the other was mold, and the third was some kind of contamination in the water that was coming um, out of the plumbing. And uh, so Leah and Cayenne, now that we have you here, can you tell us how did you find out about this? How did you find out this was an issue and, and, and how did you go about getting more information on it? Yeah, um, well, for the mice, uh, it was kind of funny. I was in one of my creative writing classes um, and this girl walked in and she was like, I've just had the worst day. And I was like, well, what happened? Why have you had a terrible day? And she was like, I woke up and there was a mouse dying on my floor and I had to take it out and you know put it outside. And it was like a whole thing. And I was kind of like, okay, back up. Like what exactly is going on? And then that was when she told me about the mouse problem um, that she had been having in her dorm. 
And I took it to Juliana, who was the features editor at the time. Um, and she was like, this could make an interesting story just because we know that there are some other dorm issues um, going on right now as well. So that was sort of how I got involved in the, in the mouse thing. Yeah, and in regards to just the dorm issues in general, it's definitely not a secret. Many or uh, potentially even most of the students have had some sort of negative experience with the dorms. I guess you could argue that it is just part of like college living, you know, it's not glamorous, obviously, but it definitely you hear it walking around campus like I had black, not I but people saying oh I had black mold in my dorm, and now I'm dealing with it because I'm not receiving help from the university about it and um, with the water contamination that was completely um, student found um, and student tested and they were the ones who came to the conclusion because again they didn't receive that assistance from the university. Um, so it's definitely not a secret. Everybody kind of just talks about it and it's, it's becomes somewhat of a casual subject just because of how common it is. So this is, in my understanding, this is not a new problem. This is, uh, there's a history of this at Brandeis, this kind of problem. Um, I'm a first year, so I can't speak to that. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I do know that the castle, which was a monument on campus and it used to be, um, a dormitory was knocked down in 2017 due to some living conditions that were not um, up to code. So that's really all I can touch on that, but definitely not new this, like it's been happening all this year, I can say. Can I, um, let me follow up a little on these students who tested the water. Can you tell us more about that? Who, how did you get connected to them and, and, and yeah. how, did they, how did they test it? It was really fascinating, I have to say, doing this interview. So I had a friend who lived in that residence hall and she was telling me how she was sick from the water um, and, you know, she had to make a trip to urgent care. You know, it was a it was an issue. And so I asked her more and I was inquiring and she said, reach out to this contact. He has been, you know, doing everything. So essentially what happened is that um, these students decided to bake a pie in one of the dormitory kitchens. And um, all of the ingredients were fresh, none of them were expired. Um, it was cooked, you know, fully cooked, and they um, served it to the students. The students who ate it uh, got sick, most of them. And then the same student made mac and cheese, which he realized started to fizz, which, you know, wasn't obviously normal. So he decided to remake the pie with all of the same ingredients in a different residence hall with a different water supply. And that's how he was able to come to the conclusion that it was the water initially, but then to test it even further, he um, you know, did some research about the symptoms that people were experiencing and thought maybe this could be um, you know, an emulsifier. So what he did was he put uh, filtered water from you know, like a Brita filter into a cup and he put oil in it and then he shook it and let it sit for a while. And he did the same with just tap water from the sink from his building. And after a number of hours, he realized that the filtered water, uh, with the filtered water, the oil had settled on the top, which is what it's supposed to do. But with the tap water, it had actually, it, it did not settle, it was mixed in. And with further research, he was able to confirm or you know, at least somewhat confirm that um, he was correct and that it was an emulsifier in the water. Wow, that's that doesn't sound pleasant. Um. That, that's a, that's a lot of um, that's almost all the steps of the of, of research process. Um, yeah, yeah. But with something that came up during the last meeting um, of licenses and franchises, that one of the other counselors wasn't sure if the um, the pictures of mold were actually mold and they were hoping that someone had tested the mold to make sure that it was mold and not something like that. Can we confirm that that was mold <laughs> or just not mold? Um, well, there was no scientific experience, uh, experiment to my knowledge, similar to the water situation, but it wasn't just in that room that was featured. It was in many different rooms. Um, so I think you can confidently say that it is mold, although I personally did not test it and I'm not sure what the testing process was like. Um, so it sounds like someone did a lot of work to prove this was a problem, but that is a, there's a, a lot of steps between, you know, knowing there's a problem and having people pay attention to it. Did you think that all that, when you wrote this article, did you think there was a chance it might get attention of 
someone in the city government? No, we definitely were not expecting that at all. Um, I think like a lot of the time, I'm, I'm new on the justice as well. Um, and I sort of had the idea that no one really outside of the school read it and kind of paid attention to the issues sort of brought up in it and that it was a very like kind of closed thing. So it was definitely a huge surprise for me. Yeah, definitely our intention was just to get the attention of the different departments that were supposed to be taking care of these issues, but we definitely didn't intend for it to go to this uh, sort of level. How do you think students at Brandeis are feeling about this issue in terms of whether the university is paying enough attention to it? There's definitely a lot of frustration felt um, in the student body, like a lot of annoyance. I think like a lot of these things are easy to kind of laugh off until they're not funny anymore, until there's like actual health and safety risks, which is sort of what had happened. Um, so it's kind of one of those things where it's like, yeah, cause a lot of frustration, cause a lot of annoyance. I think that students are frustrated and feel like they're not being heard and not being taken seriously. Um, at least that's what we found through the interview when we were interviewing and investigating um, this article. Uh, definitely lack of communication through the departments that are supposed to be taking care of these issues. So that's definitely where the frustration is, is stemming from, from what we have um, researched. And also frustration just at the fact that like students had, for all of these issues, it was stuff that students had to take into their own hands. So the responsibility that the departments had in communicating with each other directly sort of created that also. Um, how do you think that your article and having your article brought up by someone outside of Brandeis, how do you think this, do you think this will change the situation at all? We definitely intend on following up um, and doing uh, another article now that this has been brought to the public's attention more so. Um, but yeah, I guess that's all I can really say about that for now. Have you had anything to add to that? No, I think that about that about covers it. Yeah, it's definitely something that we want to look into further. Chris and James, let me ask you the same question. Now that uh, Paul, uh, Councillor Cates brought it up sort of unexpectedly, um, and now they've they've uh, renewed the license, but with the commitment for Brandeis people to come talk to them, do you think this is going to result in a change? difficult to speculate on. I mean, I don't have a lot of optimism about these kinds of things because a lot of these things tend to happen kind of like on either on the school's time or like in the case of some like, you know, landlords can get dragged out as long as it is convenient for them to, to drag it out rather than really address the problem. So it's, I think it remains to be seen like how much they respond to arm twisting or people talking to them and raising these issues. So, to say. Yeah, I think it's the arm twisting that is the real key point here. I mean, with, with proper organizing, anything is possible. Um, with overwhelming public pressure, any, you know, Brandeis would do anything, um, but it's that, it's, it's doing that, it's organizing that overwhelming public pressure. And it also has to bridge that Brandeis Waltham gap because a lot of people see that as separate. Um, but, you know, Brandeis is Waltham, Waltham is Brandeis, we have, uh, there's a relationship there. Um, and so once people start caring about, once people that aren't in Brandeis start caring about things that are in Brandeis, and once people in Brandeis are caring about things that are in Waltham, um, then, you know, I can see that kind of campaign happening. But until then, um, this, the uh, university, you know, doesn't have to answer to anybody. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm glad um, I'm glad that we're meeting you, Leah and Cayenne, so we can help form these connections uh, to totally. make uh, we could treat Brandeis like part of Waltham. Um, Chris or James, did you have any more questions for them while we have them? Oh, no, just thank you so much. Um, thanks for all the work you do. Thank you for the um, dedication to journalism. Love thank it. you guys for having us. Thank That's you so cool. much for, for having us. Yeah. yeah, thank you. All Take right. Take care. Have Take a great care. night. You too. Bye. 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 That was great. And we're going to try to keep bringing special guests on this show so you get a lot of different perspectives, not just ours. Um, so moving on to the finance committee, which did meet. 
And Chris, is there any update on the traffic study? Anything interesting come out of that meeting? Uh, I mean, it was approved. It seemed pretty straightforward to me. Uh, the city is going to pay over $20,000 for a traffic study. Um, taking into account the four, I don't know, the four largest, four most likely to get approved um, marijuana establishments coming through the pipeline right now. Um, and it's going to take probably be done in like two months, I'd say. Uh, it's 30 to 60 days after um, the traffic study approves it. Cause I think now that we've approved it, it goes to the traffic commission and then they do one more thing. And then uh, the actual traffic study happens and then it takes 30 to 60 days. Okay, and so not much of an update except that we confirmed, which I wasn't sure about last time, it's the city paying for the the study it's not um the applicants paying for the study is that yeah right? they paid they paid for their study already okay got it got it the uh next thing we need to talk about is community and economic development committee they did not meet um but chris got an update from councillor lacava a little bit of an update on one of the issues they've been talking about which is the recording and captioning of city meetings and what was the update you got chris um, well, not much of an update, but yeah, uh, so three committees didn't meet, economic community development was one of them, and it was a shame because we knew, for, uh, just like we talked about in the last meeting, that uh, Councilor LaCava, who's been taking up this issue of uh, getting all the committees recorded, was that he sent a reminder trying to engage with the issue with local access, um, and so I, when we saw that it wasn't going to meet, we knew that nothing was going to happen. But while I was sitting there, um, Council Lakawa did come up to me and say they did get an email that day about it, but because of open meeting laws, uh, they couldn't just decide to meet because they had already said they weren't going to meet. Um, so in two weeks from now, we will have an update. Um, we don't know what that is. Um, I mean, I can guess. Uh, but let's let's try. Uh, James, what do you think they're going to say? Oh, I don't want to speculate. Josh, what do you think they're going to say? They're going to say it's too expensive to record all the meetings because there's no budget in the city budget for that. There's no budget in WCAC budget for that. Well, I think you're very close, but um, but this, no, uh, local access will just give us a number. They're not going to say it's too expensive. They'll just they'll just say oh, okay, okay, give us okay. give us. I th oh God, I wish I could remember what they, the last number they gave. I wish I could. I don't remember. I think it. I think it was. You know, I'm not even going to guess. Um, but. And then the city's going to come back and say it was too expensive. That's just always what they do. It's cyclical. I don't understand why anyone thinks it, it's well, going to be different. I I hope so. It would be wonderful. It would be wonderful. Out. I would be wonderful if it's different. I will. Well, I, I have happy. one thing. If that happens, here's one thing that would make me very happy. If that happens, if Councillor Lacopper or anyone on that committee would just ask, okay, if we're not going to do do recording all meetings, how much would it cost to caption the meetings we're already doing? Because the captioning is a separate question. It is something that already should be done. It's not optional. And I don't think it should get lost in, because yeah, it might be expensive to record them while using the kind of equipment and um, technology that WCAC uses, but the caption question shouldn't get lost in that. So. I hope they approve recording it all, but if they don't, I, I will settle for someone just asking some questions about the captions. Okay, so thank you for that update. And then the last thing we wanted to talk about today is actually an update from the school committee. There is no school committee uh, recap um, show, but there probably should be. If you are someone who doesn't work for the school and isn't on the school committee, but goes to all the meetings, or almost all the meetings, and you would like to do a show like this, please get in touch with me and I'll help you set it up. That's what Waltham Data is for, to promote citizen journalism. Um, so what happened uh, last week at the school committee meeting, at the beginning of the meeting, they have a period for public comment. And Renee Arena, who was one of the candidates for school committee last year, she was not successful in getting a seat. 
she began to make a comment in which she said she had some issues with some books in the Waltham uh, schools. And she started with a book called Gender Queer. And once she said that, one of the members of the committee cut, cut her off and pointed out that the public comments have to be about something on the agenda, and this wasn't on the agenda. So there was some deliberation. They went and found the rules and confirmed that, yes, that's a rule. Comments have to be on the agenda. So um, Mr. Frassica and the mayor told Mrs. Arena, you can continue talking, but it has to be related um, to something on the agenda. And they even gave her a copy of the agenda. But she didn't continue talking about that. She made a comment about scholarships, and, and that was it. Um, but later on, some of her supporters were posting on social media that she had been censored. Um, because you're not supposed to interrupt people during public comment. But if there's a rule about an agenda, you can't enforce that rule if you can't interrupt people. So they're upset that she, so she remember she was there to talk about banning books. So she was there concerned that she was censored while she was censoring, basically. Some of her supporters were also encouraging people to write to the school committee about this. And she also made a comment on Lane later where she said the books that she was going to raise. It was Gender Queer, which is a graphic novel by Maya Kobabi, and um, another book called This Book is Gay. Um, we know that a committee, a formal complaint has been sent to Waltham High about these two books, and that means the high school will have to convene a committee to review them. Um, and we think it's a good opportunity to talk about it and some of the issues involved. So we're working on a special report on that, which we'll have for you hopefully in a few days. And that's all we have for today. Any final comments, Chris or James? I mean, censorship is, it's, 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 it is amusing that they're complaining about being, about being censored while demanding censorship of things. It's also the very common thing to be like trying to be accusing things of being like pornographic or whatever is an attempt to just like get it censored without any kind of critical review. Like that was basically what they were doing with like mouse when they were trying to get that censored too, because it had like nudity in like the scenes about like people getting put into the showers. It's it, there. There's there's this is does not feel like it's a productive thing to be humoring in our school committee meetings. Period. So. I'm glad that they did not allow her to continue. Uh, but no, I think I think that's it for today. Uh, and looking forward to uh, to next week. All Thank right. You. So we'll see you in a couple of days with a special report, and then we'll see you again next week where we'll debrief you on the full city council meeting. Thank you very much, Chris and James. Adios. All right.